Hello guys and welcome back to History of Vision Success. So continuing on then from our challenges from the extreme right leads us into our first major encounter with Adolf Hitler. By 1923, the crisis facing the Weimar regime was, uh, regime was multifaceted because in regards to the right, the army caused concern as many conservatives still looked to it to replace the democratic system. And although the Munich Beer Hall Putsch was one of the threats faced by the Young Republic in the year 1923, the event is also a crucial part of the rise of Hitler and the Nazis. So what were the core beliefs of the Nazi party and who was Adolf Hitler? Well, the Nazi party was alone in arguing that German patriots should first remove the November criminals from government before dealing with the French. Germans of all classes and political allegiances had been outraged by the occupation of the Ruhr and the trauma of hyperinflation um, had left profound psychological effects. Germany was swept by a wave of anti-French sentiment. As the historian RJ Evans has written, hyperinflation added to the feeling in the more conservative sections, um, the population of a world turned upside down, first by defeat, then by revolution, and now by economics. However, many blamed the government for what happened and middle-class support for the Republic was severely damaged Stresman's abandonment of passive resistance without achieving any concessions from the French was considered a betrayal and there was outcry from the right. In Bavaria, the right-wing government was actively defying the federal government in Berlin. Think back to the law for the um, protection of the Republic passed in order to control the assassinations. Well, this is one of the laws that the government in Bavaria refused to implement. It declared a state of emergency and the army had sworn loyalty to Gustav von Kahr as state commissioner rather than the Reich government. Amongst right-wing nationalists in the Bavarian capital in Munich, there was growing agitation for a march on Berlin to overthrow the federal government and establish a national dictatorship. And at the forefront of this activism was the leader of the NSDAP, then little known Adolf Hitler. He was a popular leader, but only one of many in Munich and was completely unknown at this point in the rest of Germany. So who was Adolf Hitler? Well, Hitler was born in Austria in 1889. And although not German by birth, he grew up believing that all Germans should be united in a greater German Reich. Initially, however, he aspired to be an artist. And after failing to get into the Academy of Art in Vienna, he became a drifter, living on the margins of society. In 1913, he moved to Munich and then volunteered for the German army at the outbreak of the First World War. And like many fellow soldiers, he was outraged at the signing of the armistice and embraced the stab in the back myth as the only possible explanation for Germany's defeat. And after the armistice, he returned to Munich, which was rapidly becoming a center of ultra-nationalistic, anti-Semitic and anti-Weimar political agitation. He worked as a political agent um, for the army. And in this capacity, he was sent to investigate the German Workers' Party as an undercover spy. And this had been set up in 1919 by Anton Drexler as a party that combined socialist ideas with nationalism. And Hitler swiftly joined the party and rapidly became its most effective orator. And in 1920, the party changed its name to the Nationalist Socialist, sorry, National Socialist German Workers' Party, the NSDAP, issued a 25 point program setting out its beliefs and in 1921, Hitler became its undisputed leader. And under his leadership, the party became dedicated to the violent overthrow of the Republic and its replacement with a Nazi dictatorship. At this stage, however, the NSDAP was just one of many ultra nationalist groups in Munich and was completely um, you know, unknown. Um, Hitler was shy, um, awkward, moody, and unable to form loving ties. He was profoundly lonely, 
isolated, contemptuous of mankind. He was suspicious in character and he admired strength and success. He was absorbed in fantasies and became convinced that he was destined to play a great role. And if we take a look at his basic core principles and ideas then. So first of all, anti-Semitism. The purity of German blood was being defiled by Jews. This is what he believed and that they should be excluded from Germany. He also believed in social Darwinism and the survival of the fittest, thinking that Germans should form a Herrenvolk or master race to dominate others. Also pan-Germanism, that all Germans should join together. It was, uh, he was very much anti-Marxist, hostile to the ideas of Karl Marx, a non-religious Jew. And also he believed in um, anti-democracy and Führer Prinzip, the, that democracy provided weak government and um, that it should be replaced by a one party state based on the principle of an all powerful leader. Uh, other ideas he expressed were anti-capitalism. He disliked what he called finance capitalism, i.e. the power that came from being very rich. And this again um, was associated with Jews. He also initially criticized big businesses, i.e. large firms, which often harmed small producers. And in terms of socialism, we've got to be careful here because although he hated Marxism, he actually spoke in favor of socialism in the sense of stressing the needs of the national community rather than the kind of community of the workers and of the working force. It was the whole national community um, together. Now, Stresman was made chancellor in August 1923 as the leader of a coalition, um, of a coalition ranging from the um, SPD to moderate conservative DVP. And by November, his government was having some success in tackling the economic crisis, especially after passive resistance to the French occupation of the Ruhr had been called off. However, there was still major political problems um, that he faced. Because as I mentioned earlier um, at the start of the lesson, the Bavarian state government, of which Munich was the capital, was under the control now of the ultra-conservative Gustav von Kahr, who, like Hitler, wished to destroy the Republican regime and opposed the decision to call off passive resistance. And both saw the national government as too weak to withstand threats from the left. Additionally, Traditionally, Bavaria was hostile to Prussia, um, had its own cultural traditions and acted independently, having kept its own monarch during the Second Reich. Von Kahr's long-term aim was actually the creation of a wholly independent Bavaria. Now, by October 1923, General von Losso, the army's commander in Bavaria, had fallen under Kahr's spell and had even begun to disobey orders from the defense minister from Berlin. So it was of these ultra conservatives who plotted with Hitler and the Nazis to march on Berlin. By the first week of November 1923, Kahr and Losso, fearing failure, actually decided to abandon the plan. However, Hitler was not so cautious and preferred to press on rather than lose the opportunity. And so on the 8th of November, when Kahr was addressing a large audience of 2000 in one of Munich's beer halls, Hitler and the Nazis took, um, burst into the meeting with his stormtroopers, um, the SA, and declared a national revolution with General Ludendorff as the new commander in chief. At gunpoint, Kahr and Losso cooperated and agreed to proceed with the uprising. However, the tables were turned when Sect used his powers to command the armed forces to resist the putsch. When on the next day the Nazis attempted to take Munich, they had insufficient support and were unable to gain control of the Munich army barracks. Hitler proved singularly ineffective. Nothing had been properly planned, and when he was forced to recognize that von Losso and von Kahr had resumed their freedom of action and were taking measures to suppress the rising, he actually suffered a slight nervous collapse, and it was actually Ludendorff that persuaded him to go ahead with the march through Munich. <clears throat> 
However, in the kind of um, ensuing battle between the forces um, and the protesters, Hitler dislocated his shoulder in the um, ensuing gun battle with the police and fled whilst Ludendorff actually allowed himself to be arrested. So the putsch was easily crushed by Bavarian police and 14 Nazis were killed and an injured Hitler was eventually arrested on a charge of treason. And what the incident showed was, again, the importance of the army to the political survival of the regime. The Nazis were banned and central control over Bavaria was actually soon reimposed. On one level, the inglorious result of the Nazi putsch was encouraging for Weimar democracy. It had withstood a dangerous threat in what was a very difficult year for it. And most significantly, Sex and the army didn't throw in their lot with the Nazis, which upset Hitler so much that he described him as a lackey of the Weimar Republic. However, once again, it was the dealings of the judiciary that raised so much concern. Hitler was sentenced to a mere five years, which is the minimum stipulation for treason, and released after less than 10 months. Ludendorff was acquitted on the grounds that although he'd been present at the time of the putsch, he was there by accident, an excuse he had actually in fact already used in 1920 over his involvement in the Cap putsch. The trial had also benefited Hitler because as, um, or Hitler's cause, because as he turned it into an opportunity to attack the Weimar regime and expound his views, he actually achieved national fame. And as the trial was just before the elections, it helped the Nazi vote. And they actually became the third largest group in Bavaria. Although the judiciary um, enjoyed the independence under the Weimar constitution, the hearts of many judges did not lie with the Republic. And as, seen, as was seen with the legal cases of the two putsches, they were biased and tended to favor the extreme right and condemn the extreme left. Indeed, during the years 1919 to 1922, out of 354 right-wing assassins, only 28 were found guilty and punished, but not one was executed. However, of the, of the 22 left-wing assassins, 10 were sentenced to death. So you can see there are far more harsher terms being applied to those from the left wing. And in a famous legal case in 1920, Erzberger accused Helfrich, the leader of the DNVP of libel, which is, you know, of lying um, in the press. But although Helfrich was condemned by the judge for his allegations and had to pay a small fine, Erzberger himself was so discredited that he had to actually resign himself. And the judge's prejudiced handling of the case revealed his political sympathies. So to what extent was there really a threat? Well, the success of the Democratic parties in the Reichstag elections of January 1919 at first disguised some of Weimar's fundamental problems in its political structure. But opposition to the Republic ranged from indifference to brutal violence. And as early as 1920, popular support for Weimar democracy began to switch to the extremes. And the extent of opposition from the extreme right to democracy was not always appreciated. Instead, President Ebert and the Weimar government overestimated the threat from the extreme left, and they came to rely on the forces of reaction for justice, law and order. This was partly because the conservative forces successfully exploited the image of the left as a powerful threat. So in many respects, it was the persistence of the old attitudes in the major traditional national institutions that represented the greatest long-term threat to the Republic. The violent forces of counter-revolution, -revol as shown by the pictures of Cap and, and of Hitler, were too weak and disorganized to seize power in the early years. But the danger of the extreme right was just below the surface. It was the real growing threat to Weimar democracy.